Uh, well, first yeah. of all, I'd like to thank Mildred and uh, Keith for this uh, opportunity to join this webinar, and I'd like to thank all of you for joining us to tonight. Uh, my topic is uh, research is a passion, and I wanted to actually uh, just pose this in this way because is if because if research is indeed your passion, I want to convince you in the next few minutes that ophthalmology can be an ideal home for you. And so I'd like to think that I can inspire you uh, to actually consider applying your skills in research to this extraordinary discipline. And as Ross said earlier, this is, a, um, I think, one of the best uh, specialties. And I think that uh, Terry also mentioned that most people are happy in ophthalmology as well. I'd like to share with you uh, a case study as well as present some data and then end, end with some pearls. But first of all, I'd like to just uh, give you some insight in terms of how I consider this uh, journey to ophthalmology. And, uh, and I, when I was probably in med school, as many of you are, even before med school, I thought about my strong interest in science. and and wanting to make a difference in the world. I didn't think I was going to go into health, but uh, certainly there are different paths to consider. You can be a scientist, and you can consider getting a PhD. You can be a physician, an MD, or you can be both a physician and a scientist. You don't have to have an MD, PhD, but you could certainly have the MD. Or you can take another route and be a public health professional uh, even graduating from college and just uh, getting an MPH, or you can get an MD, PhD, or MD, P, uh, MPH. So there are many different paths. In my own case, I always had an interest in, in science going back to high school. And so many of you might uh, actually connect with this story. I mean, as far back as junior high school, I remember being part of science fairs and uh, as well as in high school being part of uh, science fairs and then going off to a summer research program and, and doing an independence research project. So from that, I went on to my training uh, as an engineer. I didn't think I was going to go to med school because I wanted to be an engineer. So I went to MIT and had uh, the opportunity to get my bachelor's and master's in chemical engineering decided to stay in Boston and go to Harvard Medical School and, and uh, while there thought that I would go back into research and even go back to biomedical engineering, but decided that I really wanted to go out and practice. I fell in love with seeing patients while I was in med school. Did my internship uh, in San Francisco, residency back home uh, in New Orleans at uh, uh, Safety Net Hospital, Charity Hospital and then came back up to Boston to do a fellowship in glaucoma at Mass Eye and Ear. I've had a few faculty appointments and currently at the University of Pennsylvania. And uh, in addition to my faculty appointments, I've done some administrative things along the way as well. I was a department chair, a dean, and a senior vice president for health sciences. So within academia, there's so many different paths. Ophthalmology gives you that, uh, that chance to, to really explore uh, additional avenues because you can um, really um, put boundaries around your, your practice in a way so you can do other things. I, I have many research interests ranging from the basic sciences to clinical trials. And now these days, I have my most fun serving on boards, uh, Ascension, which is a large Catholic uh, health system in 22 states, 140 hospitals, and the Defense Health Board. So yes, even an ophthalmologist can, can go beyond the boundaries of, of, of one's field and influence health policy. I'd like to just uh, take a moment and, and really bring a patient into this, because one of the things that inspire me is, mm -hmm. uh, is, is well, really my patients. I just saw some patients today. and. I'm always thinking about why do certain patients get certain diseases and not others? What, what can I do to help patients remember their meds? Every patient presents an opportunity to think about what are the possibilities. So consider this patient, a 59-year-old uh, woman who was referred by a primary care provider for a routine eye exam. She had no previous history of, 
a comprehensive eye exam. And she, her, she complained to her, to her primary care provider that she was having trouble with her vision. And so that's why she had an eye exam. And so she was recently laid off and now insured on Medicaid, which uh, has been expanded in her state since implementation of the Affordable Care Act. She does have uh, other comorbidities, such as hypertension and diabetes. And she has fairly good vision, but still you can see it's not 20-20. It's 2040 in the right eye and 2050 in the left. Um, she does have open angles and normal anterior segments and mild cataracts. Pressures are elevated more in the left than the right. And uh, she does have uh, normal uh, or average uh, central corneal thickness and, and uh, some cuff to disc asymmetry, as you can see from her field on the left. Uh, she has a superior neurofiber bundle defect uh, uh, and an inferior nasal step. And the right is still uh, fairly uh, okay, the, the right visual field. And so you kind of wonder, why didn't she have a comprehensive eye exam before? So that's a question, particularly when you think about all the things that our patients uh, in this country actually deal with in terms of visual impairment. I mean, when you consider the fact that we have 90 million people over the age of 40 that have some kind of vision problem, why aren't we talking about vision every day? And, uh, and visual uh, impairments responsible for a substantial amount of direct and indirect medical costs that's associated with reduced quality of life, and, uh, and there's an increased risk for depression, anxiety, and other psychological problems. And it amplifies the effects and complicates the management of other comorbidities. And this next slide actually really presents that very nicely. When you think about all of the patients that you see uh, in the clinic, and of course on the left-hand side, you see the the problems range from diabetes to hearing impairment, low back pain. Uh, when you consider just the condition, there's an impact on that patient's ability to perform uh, activities of, of daily living. But when you couple those uh, diseases with, uh, with visual impairment, Look at the number of times uh, in terms of the intensity that visual impairment adds to the difficulties that that patient will have in their quality of life. And so you kind of wonder, why aren't we doing more to teach about uh, vision in, in medical schools? Because there, it is a significant impact. And so that's what drove me into ophthalmology is because when I saw my patients, um, many times it was their vision that was the thing that really made them unhappy and impacted their quality of life um, negatively. Uh, when you think about all of the things that impact our patients and why our patients get sick, 70% of the contributors to health are modifiable and only 30% of the contributors to, to health uh, are related to genetics. So we as providers, we as individuals, can control our destiny as it relates to our health. And so within all of these statements are research questions. There are research questions that we could ask at the patient level, the provider level, at the system level, and at the community level. And so I, I always like to use uh, this example because a picture is worth a thousand words. Uh, one of the things that drives me, since I was always so interested in social justice, are the disparities that we see in healthcare. If you look at the patient on the left, the picture on the left, these are patient. This is a patient that's at in hospice care. The provider is standing by the door, uh, as opposed to being clustered so close to the gurney. On the other, on the right hand side, you see people are are closer together. Why do we have this occur? In, in healthcare. Uh, we see it in ophthalmology. And so here's an example of health services research that's really showing us some trends that we need to pay attention to. This was a study that came out of the University of Michigan where they looked at claims data derived from large managed care uh, networks and Medicaid data and uh, compared commercial insurance uh, to Medicaid data in terms of what happens when a patient is initially diagnosed with glaucoma 
and what are your expectations of whether or not they should get a visual field, fundus photography, aqua imaging, uh, in, when, when they have Medicaid versus uh, commercial insurance. And so you would expect that everybody should be 100% because that's what our clinical guidelines actually dictate, that everyone should be getting those tests within 15 months of diagnosis. However, what was found in the study that those that had commercial health insurance were more likely to get these tests as opposed to Medicaid. So that's a uh, powerful uh, piece of information that really should be should drive policy. And when you compare those patients that were diagnosed that underwent no testing, if you had Medicaid, you were more likely not to get any of these tests, these important tests within 15 months compared to commercial. So that's an example of how research can make a difference. So returning to our patients, let's think about three key takeaways. Her diagnosis was delayed. It's important to remember the best treatment to achieve the best outcome, and we must cultivate a culture of eye health and advocate for benefits that affirm preventive eye care. First, let's, talk, let's think about the diagnosis that was delayed because she hadn't had a comprehensive eye exam. What are the opportunities for additional research? Well, first of all, what's the genetic basis for her eye disease? Now, you're going to see T1, T2, T3, T4, uh, in the various slides. T1 is really basic research, and so this would be an opportunity for basic research. T2 is, is really uh, clinical research, really more applied research. How do I actually understand, for instance, what are the risk factors for early diagnosis? And then another T2 example would be easy to use advanced technology to diagnose diseases earlier. One of the things that drew me to ophthalmology was the technology, using lasers, using imaging. We have the most beautiful pictures uh, that you ever want to see. So, so there are some visual benefits uh, as well in, in ophthalmology from a testing perspective because graphically it, it's so attractive. So should, should we recommend the best treatment to ensure the best outcome? And so we want to generate evidence to guide policy decisions and evidence-based actions. And so this will be a T2, a T3 uh, opportunity. And these are nomen this is nomenclature that the NIH uses. Uh, so you, you may want to uh, have the opportunity to provide greater evidence for interventions that preserve vision, optimizes quality of life, and is cost-effective. Also, big data. Now we're getting into the community, more of the health impact kinds of things that can impact uh, the way that we care for patients uh, and what are the best interventions in specific uh, populations. And then finally, we really do need to have everyone thinking more proactively about population health. And so what are some opportunities from research for research there? Understanding the drivers of human behavior to seek appropriate health care. Behavioral economics is a whole field that could be applied to ophthalmology. Or developing economic models to reaffirm the benefits of optimizing eye health and using big data to understand um, how best to actually uh, really uh, have an impact. There is a, a report that was put out by the National Academy of Sciences and uh, I'm just um, sharing the title with you here. There is a, uh, a URL you can actually reference, Making Eye Health a Population Health Imperative. The National Academy of Medicine is one of the national academies that actually puts out these reports. And, and I was one of the ophthalmologists on that uh, panel. But you can download this uh, in, uh, uh, online. I finally figured out why it was advancing. OK, on its own. All right. So finally, reflections on focusing on a career in op ophthalmic research. You want to engage mentors, network with peers, collaborate on projects and publishing. Uh, I think uh, you heard that in the previous presentation. But most importantly, particularly as uh, those of you who are in college or in medical school, you want to develop specific skills 
so that you are an expert in something. Having an expertise maybe in molecular genetics or epidemiology. And then you can expand and broaden your connections with others and broaden your scope and staying focused on specific goals. So these are some thoughts that I hope will uh, give you some insight in terms of what are some research opportunities in ophthalmology, why are you, you might be interested in this field. I think it's a, a field that provides um, some flexibility, much more so than I think other fields. Uh, I certainly with all my administrative responsibilities at University of Pennsylvania, I still see patients, I still do lasers, and it is a gratifying field that I still enjoy. Uh, but definitely, it's all about the patient and understanding how we can best serve every patient out there in the United States, uh, regardless of uh, social economic status, ethnic background, and um, to give people the best opportunity for optimal health and vision. So I'll take any questions.